The China Global South podcast is supported in part by the Africa China Reporting Project at Wits University in Johannesburg and by our subscribers. Thank you. If you'd like to subscribe for daily news and exclusive analysis about every aspect of China's engagement in Africa, Asia, and throughout the developing world, go to chinaglobalsouth.com forward slash subscribe. Hello and welcome to another edition of the China Global South podcast, a proud member of the Seneca Podcast Network. I'm Eric Olander. Kobus is unfortunately traveling this week, so he's not going to be able to join us. He'll be back with us again next week. But in the meantime, though, we have an absolutely fascinating show ahead. In fact, it's been a very big week in the Chinese development uh, finance space. That's a space we've been following very closely this year in terms of how China is going about debt restructuring in places like Zambia, Sri Lanka, Ecuador, and many other places. Uh, Ghana is now on deck as well as Ethiopia. And then there's the ongoing standoff between China and the multilateral development banks, as well as questions about what kind of lender is China going to be in the future. Well. We got some clues on this. Two very important reports came out this week that tell starkly different stories. First, researchers at the Inter-American Dialogue in Washington D.C. and Boston University's Global Development Policy Center published some fascinating new findings on Chinese lending to countries in Latin America and the Caribbean. Let me give you a few of the highlights here. Last year. China Development Bank and the China Exim Bank issued eight hundred and thirteen million dollars in new loans to three countries in the region. Here they are: China Development Bank issued five hundred million dollars in loans to the Banco de Brazil.、Uh, then there was a hundred and twenty-one million dollar concessional loan from the China Exim Bank to build a road in Barbados, and a one hundred ninety-two million dollar loan to Guyana for a railway project. Well, this is no doubt encouraging for those countries, given the difficulties that many developing countries are finding in terms of getting access to capital. These numbers are way smaller than what China's policy banks used to lend in the past, especially in places like Latin America. Consider this: in each of the years from 2015 to 2017, both China Development Bank and the China Exim Bank lent countries in the Americas at least 20 billion dollars. A year, and back in 2011, 12 years ago, that was more than 30 billion just in one year. But those big numbers are never going to come back again, simply because the vast majority of countries in Latin America, and really throughout the broader global South, simply can't service the debt. We know this because a landmark report that also came out this week. Showed that China's central bank doled out two hundred and forty billion dollars in emergency financing to twenty-two countries, including Argentina, Pakistan, and Nigeria, over the past two decades. Now, that report was produced by a team of economists at the World Bank, Aid Data, Harvard University, and the Kiel Institute in Germany, and points to some very serious problems with the Belt and Road Initiative. That, in fact, a lot of countries borrowed just way too much money from China. And now Beijing is having to bail them out as kind of a lender of last resort. But let's now see how this is all playing out in Latin America and the Caribbean. And for that, I'm absolutely thrilled to have back on the show again today two of the world's leading analysts on the subject: Margaret Myers, who is a fellow at the Woodrow Wilson Center and directs the Asia and Latin America program at the Inter-American Dialogue, and Rebecca Ray, a senior academic researcher at the Boston University Global Development Policy Center. Becky, Margaret, a very good morning to you both, and welcome back to the show. Thank you, Eric. Pleasure to be here. Thanks so much, Eric. Becky, let's start with you. Tell us how the report that you did with Margaret intersects with the other report by those group of economists that talk about China being the lender of last resort. What's the story here? Because on the surface, they seem to go in different directions. One shows an increase in lending, and the other one shows really lending for purposes of distress. Tell us how those fit together into a single story. I think this is exactly what we would expect during a time of economic crisis or economic downturn. The aid data, Harvard, World Bank, Kiel study you mentioned, is a great study because it looks at 
short-term liquidity support, not what we consider development finance, not the kind of long-term lending for industry, infrastructure, social development that you might expect from the World Bank or CDB or Chexem. Instead, we're talking about an equivalent to what you might get from the IMF or from a regional financial arrangement. There's a network of bilateral swap arrangements that we call the Global Financial Safety Net. And we actually track all of these lines uh, and what's available throughout the world uh, in conjunction with UNCTAD and the Free University of Berlin at our GFSN tracker, gfsntracker.com. And it shows these are available for central banks to swap currency to help with uh, for periods of usually six months or less. So these are short term things. They don't really add to national debt. They kind of help float currencies to help prevent balance of payments crises. So that's what you'd expect now. We're not starting big new projects right now. Instead, we're floating currencies to get through a time of economic difficulty. That's not surprising at all. And I think it's one coherent story. Well, you're sounding a lot more kind of relaxed and casual about this compared to the news coverage that we've been seeing in the FT and the Wall Street Journal that said, Henny Penny, the sky is falling. This is the end of the Belt and Road. China's in distress. China is really, I mean, again, your assessment of it is very different than a lot of the media coverage that we've been reading. Yes, I think that the end of the BRI has been much touted, and I'm not convinced personally, because the BRI is much more than long-term lending for infrastructure, which became kind of the way we Western experts think about it, because that's what we measure, and that's what you can see. But the BRI is much more complicated than that, includes short-term liquidity support, trade, investment, bilateral coordination, all kinds of things. So of course, we're going to pivot from long-term development finance to short-term liquidity support during a time like this. That's not surprising. I think that any Sinologist or longtime China observer who's really been steeped in the development of the BRI would kind of see this shift among the different axes of the BRI rather than pulling back altogether. The end of the BRI would mean less engagement altogether. We're not seeing less engagement. We're just seeing a pivot towards the kind of engagement you have during crisis years. Okay, so Margaret, let's get your take on it. How do those two reports, yours and the the 250, I don't even know what the name of the other one is. I'll call it the $240 billion debt distress report. How do those kind of intersect? What's your take on it? Yeah, I, I do agree that, you know, we aren't seeing... One, one phrase that I like to use is, the BRI is dead, long live the BRI, right? The B, and by that, I simply mean... <laughs> yes, Mark Twain will always live forever in all of this. His death is greatly exaggerated, right? It's, it will go on in you know, perpetuity, but it's changing, right? And we're also seeing other initiatives being announced and a rethinking of the way that China is engaging globally, whether in the financial realm or otherwise. And I think what, you know, what we've seen in terms of of financing in Latin America, but also in other parts of the world is very much characteristic of that, right? So we aren't, just as you mentioned, Eric, we're not seeing the levels of finance that we saw, for example, in 2010, you know, upwards of of $30 billion. This was 113, you know, million to three countries. It represents an uptick in overall lending, but we aren't reaching sky high numbers. We're probably never going to again, right? Those are days that will never come back again. Exactly. So, I mean, yes, I think these considerations, uh, you know, especially as concerns the debt situation across the board, the limitations that that places on Chinese banks, you know, not wanting to engage more extensively at a moment when they understand that they're going to be having to grapple with a lot of different debt related situations and negotiating and renegotiating and restructuring the terms of a lot of this debt, whether in Africa or elsewhere. And and certainly in certain countries already, we've seen these cases in Latin America with, you know, Ecuador being the most prominent recent case. There are other reasons that why, you know, in addition to this sort of broad debt crisis, why we see a drawdown in in overall lending, you know, one is that Venezuela is off the map. You know, there's no lending to Venezuela at all. And there hasn't been for a number of years now. And that for many, many years accounted for the vast majority of Chinese finance in, in the region. Another, in my mind, at least, is that, you know, these loans these, especially these sovereign loans were largely intended to help Chinese companies to establish a presence in the region in the first place, right? To establish a footprint, to develop the sorts of networks that they would need to be able to engage effectively and compete effectively with other companies in the region. And they've achieved that objective largely, right? Chinese companies are indeed very, very competitive in a wide range of sectors. And so the model itself is one, you know, that maybe has, uh, is no longer needed, at least not in the ways that that it was back in the 1990s or or early 2000s in the case of Latin America. 
or even more recently uh, in certain industries. But yes, I mean, I don't see these two reports necessarily or the two messages that we're conveying as, as mutually exclusive, right, or is all that different. It's just that, yes, there will continue to be lending. I do also believe strongly, I don't know if Becky agrees with me on this, but that a lot of this lending is indeed, you know, political or in, in nature, right? There is a very strong interest and has been a sustained interest for a very, very long time in engaging with the Caribbean and issuing loans. They aren't multi-billion dollar loans in most cases, they're smaller loans, but the Caribbean has been a feature of Chinese finance for many, many years. And again, this year was two loans issued to the Caribbean, as you mentioned, but also even, you know, in the years past, even amid COVID, right? We saw a continued engagement with negotiation with the Caribbean on wide ranging issues of interest to that particular region. Okay, Becky, let's pick up the conversation there. So what do the countries tell us in terms of Guyana, Barbados, and Brazil? Brazil, of course, got the lion's share. That makes sense given the size of the economy. But if you're sitting in Washington or some other capital and you're reading through your report and you're trying to understand why did the Chinese choose these countries over other countries, what do you tell people? I think the Caribbean is easy to ignore or forget when we're thinking about the Latin American and Caribbean region as a whole, because the numbers are so much smaller. But Margaret's absolutely right. In terms of the number of loans, Caribbean has been kind of punching against its weight in the finance relationship with China for many years. And it's only when the giant borrowers like Venezuela take a back seat or disappear from the picture altogether that the ongoing relationship with the Caribbean really rises to the top. And I think this is perhaps most interesting with the case of Suriname, which is currently in debt renegotiation process, beginning that process. And Suriname owes a greater share of its debt to China than any other country in the LAC region. A uh, little Suriname, because a little bit of money goes a long way in a small country. So this isn't actually new. It's not a pivot. It's simply that it no longer makes sense for the China Development Bank to continue issuing billions of dollars in general purpose support for Venezuela's state-owned oil companies. And without that, really notice the fact that they've been engaging with the Caribbean countries all along. But at the same time, there is still a, a very serious need for infrastructure throughout Central America and South America. So, Margaret, on the one hand, you say, well, Chinese companies don't need the support anymore. But certainly the borrowing countries have an infrastructure deficit that is quite acute. So I would imagine there's still an appetite for them to borrow, even if maybe the Chinese aren't as willing to do what they did in the past. Absolutely, Eric. I mean, I think there are a lot of countries approaching China right now with, you know, projects of interest. Also, Chinese companies continuing to identify projects of interest, right? Uh, whether we're talking, you know, uh, greenfield projects or mergers and acquisitions, there's an interest right now in among China Southern in, in acquiring Enel, right? And which is a electricity transmission, but also generation company in, in Peru. And so a lot of activity still. The question is what will materialize, right? And what are the constraints? How is China viewing risk and how many resources is can it bring to bear? I would say that, you know, in addition, we should be very careful to note that what we're talking about here are, you know, development finance institutions. We're talking about China Development Bank and China Export Import Bank. But there are other sources of finance, right, that are supporting a lot of the project development that we're seeing across the region. And that includes the commercial banks, you know, very importantly. ICBC has been doing a lot of work, including amid the pandemic. Most of that is focused in Argentina, right? But there are deals being struck, some of them very similar in nature or supportive of the same sorts of sectors that you see the policy banks and or development finance institutions Supporting. There's also, of course, Chinese companies bringing their own finance to bear in certain projects, especially if we're talking about public private partnerships. And so, you know, it's not as though this drop in lending, and especially sovereign lending, will result in no activity whatsoever. There are other, you know, means by which to push these projects forward. And so it will be a matter of really, you know, articulating very clearly what countries need and then understanding how that aligns with Chinese interests. And so that's why we say we're at something of an inflection point, because there are a lot of new constraints, right? But there's still a lot of interest and considerable need. And so it's going to be a matter of matching up these wide ranging and varied interests to achieve certain objectives. 
Well, it's interesting that you talk about alternate lenders beyond the policy banks, because also this week, Brazil's former president, Rousseff, took charge of the New Development Bank. And if the New Development Bank doesn't sound familiar to you, uh, that's the BRICS Bank. Uh, so that is a that was started with $50 billion, if I recall, in financing. Brazil has not been a major beneficiary of that. Uh, South Africa has uh, and uh, India has, interestingly enough, but not. But now that there is a Brazilian at the top, you know, Becky, do you see that as potentially a gateway? for new financing from, say, the New Development Bank? Well, sure. Actually, one really interesting thing happened last year, which is the, the first jointly financed project between the New Development Bank and Fon Plata, which is a small regional multilateral development bank just for the countries along the River Plate. And so we're seeing uh, the New Development Bank not lending directly to Brazil much, as you said, but really getting more active in the region in general. We're also seeing other countries asking to join BRICS and or the New Development Bank. And that's fascinating to me as an economist because the New Development Bank can't really issue a lot of bonds right now. The R in the BRICS has significant sanctions against it. Uh, and so countries are hoping to join into these multilateral efforts even when there isn't a lot of upfront money to be had right now. With Lula's protege, Rousseff, at the helm of the New Development Bank, that perspective of the strength of multilateralism among developing countries as core to their worldview, I think we're going to see more and more of that. Yeah, so Lula was supposed to go to Beijing on Sunday, but unfortunately he came down with pneumonia and they had to cancel his trip. A lot of deals were postponed. One very important deal just on the Brazil side was that the meat ban that was in place for about a month uh, was lifted, and that was really causing havoc in Brazil's meat export uh, sector, 20 to $25 million a day in lost sales. So that was at least one thing that happened, even though Lula didn't go. Just, Becky, to your point about other countries wanting to join the BRICS, Argentina, I think, is next up in line to be the BRICSA. Uh, <laughs> it hasn't been finalized yet, but Iran also wants to join. You're right, the queue to join the BRICS is growing quite large. Becky, I'm just curious if we look back at 2023 at the end when we're talking to you in December, do you think that your report next year at this time will focus more on lithium producing countries in South America? Because that's where the Chinese have a strategic interest. And I'm, I'm just going back to what you said in terms of the following the strategic interests of the Chinese. So the initial phase of lending was to support Chinese companies. But now there is a, a worldwide battle for critical minerals and battery metals. In South America in many ways is ground zero for a lot of those. Do you see lending following that path? Well, Margaret made a really great point a few minutes ago when she said one of the main drivers of sovereign lending by China's development finance institutions has been to help Chinese firms get a foothold in the region. And they have that foothold now. And uh, I'll give a plug for an upcoming report, which I can't spoil yet, but I can tease. Our China Latin America Caribbean Economic Bulletin will be out soon in the next few weeks. And it'll show the role of these firms in direct investment in that area, more so necessarily than lending. Uh, Bolivia recently had an international competitive tender to help it develop its lithium reserves. And the package that it ended up signing involves not just developing lithium, but even developing the infrastructure necessary to get to the lithium. So these are multifaceted packages of investment and finance that often work together. But as Margaret said, these firms now have a foothold and may not need CDB and Checksum to bolster them as much. And Margaret, let's get your take on that. I agree entirely. I don't know that our that this particular report, right, will will feature more in the way of of lending to, for example, you know, lithium triangle countries. And indeed, a lot of that is happening through the participation of Chinese companies themselves and their own competitiveness, right, in terms of achieving these concessions. What I will say, I mean, Argentina is such an interesting case, Eric, because. Ahead of the Olympics, right, the Winter Olympics in Beijing, we saw President Fernandez meet with President Xi Jinping. And there they struck a very large sort of deal, right, or at least a indication of deals to come, many, many different deals to come. That included, you know, the, the nuclear facility that's been proposed for a very long time and would be the first uh, sort of indication of or demonstration of the use of Hualong technologies, you know, outside of Pakistan, 
in China itself. So very importantly, symbolic for China, right? And, and potentially helpful for, for Argentina as well, but also the expansion of the Cauchati Solar Project, which is the largest in South America and a wide range of other, of other deals, right? That were, that were proposed. Not a lot has happened. Not a lot has happened. Um, and that is indeed, as you mentioned, a very strategic place, right? For, for China to, to be engaged. So between the time of that, that meeting and now we haven't seen a lot of movement and we're planning to actually, you know, we were all set to put those, those deals in our report and they did not, at least not yet, materialize. So it's worth asking why. Why do you think that is? And it's interesting because at the Olympics meeting, after President Fernandez went to Beijing, yes. he then went to Moscow and had a beautiful photo op with President Putin and then mooned the IMF and basically said the IMF is all sorts of problems. And he took a very decidedly anti-Western, anti-US stance that again, doesn't seem like it's paid off. There was rumors that Argentina was going to buy the JF-17 fighter jet. That didn't come through. What's going on? I mean, what do you think? Is there tension or is it just it, these things take time and that's the way it goes? Margaret, what do you think? It could be that these things take time, and indeed they do. But, you know, with Cauchari, it, that, it seemed to me something of an obvious uh, deal, right? But uh, this was something that had been supported already by China Exim Bank a number of years ago. There was buy-in. It's, it represents what the sort of, you know, the newest iteration of the BRI is hoping to represent, which is a real commitment to green transformation, to enter green energy in general. And that's been a, a largely successful, deemed a largely successful project, right? So supporting it would make a lot of sense. But, you know, for me, it's all part of this sort of rethinking and reevaluation of priorities on the part of, of China's banks, uh, its lending institutions, whether they be, you know, the policy banks, the DFIs, or the commercial banks, ICBC or others. And, you know, we've seen very recently Eric, as you, you noted, this centralization of administration of and regulation of, of the banking sector. And I think that's going to play out in very interesting ways, perhaps even, you know, making decisions that much more difficult for these banks as they look to pursue projects. That and, you know, just a, a broader look at and more intensive look at risk across the board. Becky, it's very interesting because the timing of this report coming out also coincided with the annual migration to Washington, it's like a, like birds migrating, of the Pentagon commanders from the regional theaters plus the Secretary of State, they all appear before the various appropriations committees to ask for lots of money in next year's budget. And what's interesting is I sit there painfully and watched hours and hours and hours of appropriations testimony from the CENTCOM commander, the SOUTHCOM commander, the AFRICOM commander, Blinken. I do that so you don't have to. That's, the, that's what I like to say. But what was so interesting was how obsessed... I mean, and obsessed is the right word to use. The senators and representatives were on the Hill about China's influence, specifically in the Americas. None other than Senator Marco Rubio, who looks in the mirror every day and says, hello, good morning, Mr. President. And he sees an opportunity here to really ride China. And he has been going saying, listen, China is the biggest threat we face, specifically in Latin America and the Caribbean. What do you think folks in D.C., and I'd like, Margaret, since you're in D.C., I want to get your take on this. What is the takeaway that they have from your report? Yes, I mean, on the Hill, there is, there is this consensus it's a very strong <laughs> consensus. It's a very emotional consensus. I said the word right? obsession, and but okay, go ahead. Obsession is probably <laughs> a very a, a good characterization of it, right? And you know, I think they read our report, they see that yes, indeed, the numbers reflect a you know a slowing of of activity in this particular space. But in general, the focus is on broader trends, including in terms of investment and trade. A lot of China's you know economic influence is is coming from the trade dynamic at play, right? Yeah. So I don't know that they see this particular shift as shifting the overall dynamic or reducing considerably, you know, China's influence, which is largely based on, on economic engagement, right? In the region, as you probably heard from, you know, the Southcom commander, there's also considerable concern about some of the actual investments that are being made, acquisitions that are being made, especially as concerns, you know, certain infrastructure like ports, which are viewed as having, um, you know, something of a strategic implication in the event that they're dual use. But I mean, these these are the areas of focus, and they're very narrow. And these data points that we that we try and communicate are probably taken into an, into account, but I don't large think they largely shift the view. On the hill. It's interesting because Laura Richardson, who is the Southcom commander, so for the Western Hemisphere, she, it's interesting in, in so much of her testimony and her commentary on China, talks not about 
military, but talks about economic. And a lot of these investments, and they talk about Huawei, and they talk about port deals and whatnot. So it's interesting how the intersection between security and economics plays out. Becky, in January, we talked to you about a report you guys did in terms of the changes in the evolution of Chinese lending in the Americas. And you borrowed a phrase from someone else called small is beautiful. If I recall, that's not your your language. That was somebody else's. That That's correct. That's, yeah. But when I, and so when I was reading this report, I said, aha, this is what she meant. Small is beautiful. Can you kind of help us merge those two reports together in terms of what you forecasted out in January and what came out last week? Absolutely. When we talked last in January, one of the things we talked about was China has a new hesitancy, a new emphasis on due diligence up front before signing off on a project. We think about major projects that borrowers are trying to get financed. Margaret mentioned Argentina's solar farm expansion. That's an obvious big one. But in January, I mentioned Pakistan's ML1 rail line, this tremendous over a thousand kilometer rail line that Pakistan really wants to get refurbished. They've been negotiating for upwards of six months trying to get the number right. Is it bankable? Will there be cost overruns? All of these concerns that we didn't really see dominate the conversation 10 years ago. 10 years ago, it was, oh, does Venezuela's public oil company need money? We'll write a check. <laughs> and so that's the pivot towards targeted, more thought out lending. And I you know, every country knows, and they'll teach you at Econ 101. I'm an economist. I've taught it. The number one way to get your economy moving again after a downturn is infrastructure. China's famous for financing infrastructure at this point. So the demand is there, but we're seeing a renewed uh, or even a new emphasis on China's part of really making sure that these are loans that are going to pay for themselves. And in some cases, loans that aren't going to cause them trouble reputationally. We were going to talk, I'm sure, <laughs> still this hour about Honduras and the Honduras potential dam project that is right up there because Sino Hydro, major dam contractor in China, has pulled out of a controversial dam project in Honduras before because of reputational risk, because of environmental conflict. So all of these considerations are really important now. Well, let's transition to Honduras. So this, again, another big week. I don't know how many times I've said that in this show. It was a big week in China, America, as you guys must have been very busy this week. So Honduras finally severed ties with Taiwan, bringing the total number of Taiwan's diplomatic allies around the world to just 13. And again, that may even shrink to 12 because Paraguay is on the fence as well. We can talk about that. But Margaret, you did a survey of folks that you published at IAD to get their impressions. You even weighed in on the Honduras switch and the decision to leave. Hond Taiwan was decidedly and not surprisingly upset about it. Interestingly, President Tsai Ing-wen, she came out very firm and said, we are not going to engage in dollar diplomacy anymore. That is not how we're going to do it. So basically, if you want to go, go, but we're not going to write the big checks anymore. There were allegations and accusations and recriminations that went back and forth that apparently Honduras wanted $2.5 billion out of Taiwan. Taiwan said, uh-uh. Both sides deny the way that that was framed and whatnot. But here we are. Honduras made the switch. They claim that it was nothing to do with politics or ideology, and it had everything to do with economics. Some of the people you spoke with, Margaret, said, you know what? If they're banking on the Chinese to bring out the big checkbook, that was a bad, a bad bet that they made. Tell us a little bit about your reading of it and the folks that you spoke with in terms of the situation with Honduras, Taiwan, and China. Yeah, I mean, I think that's exactly right. This decision was made, in my view at least, largely on the prospect of securing finance for the Patuca Dos Dam project, right? There's already been a Patuca Tres, which I believe came online this year and was supported, you know, by Chinese finance. But, you know, Patuca Dos is an extension of, of that and part of a, a group of, of dam projects, three of them in total, right? That, that Honduras has been promoting for a long time as part of its overall energy strategy. So this is the rationale largely in my view, in addition to, you know, hopes as many of these countries have of, you know, expanding in, in considerable ways their economic linkages, ties to, to China, whether on the trade front or as, as concerns other forms of investment or cooperation. But as was noted, you know, in this Q&A, and as I, I believe I noted too, you know, it, the outcomes vary considerably on a case-by-case -case basis when when countries cut ties with 
Taiwan and establish them with China. It's, uh, you know, there are some cases such as that of Panama, which cut ties in 2017, and then, you know, was the first country in the region to sign a BRI memorandum of, of understanding, where there were 16 deals, right? Some of them quite large, uh, you know, a uh, LNG plant, for example, a possible port projects, some major road construct, uh, road and uh, and bridge construction. All of these things were were promised just as, at that particular moment, and and so, and you know, in the meantime, we've seen a few of those be placed in a period of sort of protracted stasis. They are, you know, not moving forward because of concerns about the ways in which they were negotiated. But nevertheless, right, the activity was extensive. Then you have a lot of other cases where. And not a whole lot is materializing. Like Nicaragua, for example, right? Like Nicaragua, like even El Salvador. You know, there were a lot lot of big things talked about at the beginning of that of that relationship, right? Including rehabilitation of the Launium port and the possible uh, special economic zone that would take up sixty percent of the country, including much of the coast, and would you know be given to a Chinese company for a period of in in the form of a concession for a period of potentially fifty years. Things like that, big big projects. Those have not come to pass. Instead, we see things like Surf City, right, which is sort of waterfront rehabilitation project, which is very small in scale, or a library, you know, that will have Bukele's <laughs> name on it and, and things of that of that nature, but very, very small projects. And so, the, you know, it really does, it really does vary. And a lot of this has to do with, you know, as Becky mentioned, a rethinking on the part of companies about risk, about, you know, reputational risk, operational risk, financial risk, and whether it makes sense to invest, you know, in some of these places. And a lot of these countries are not going to be attractive investment environments for Chinese companies, at least when taking into account, you know, financial considerations, just as they are not for a lot of other international companies. And so this is the challenge, right? And so maybe Patuka Dos will materialize. I, I, I would assume there'll be some movement on that at the very least, right? But some of the other things um, I think are, are unlikely to, I don't know that we'll see a, a boom, in other words, in bilateral relations. Do you get a sense, I mean, from the outside looking in, and you guys are much better versed in this than I am, that there's a certain bait and switch that happens here, that the Chinese in their appeal to these countries to switch their recognition from Taiwan say, you know, if you recognize with us and you come with us, we're going to give you lots of trade, lots of investment. You see what's happened all over the world. You got to come and do it with us. And then they looked at their trade balance sheet with Taiwan. And to be fair, Honduras, Taiwan trade really wasn't that much. Taiwan itself did not seem to really put a lot of financial muscle behind the relationship. So, I mean, I don't blame the Hondurans for doing it, given when they look at it and say, well, listen, we're not getting much out of the Taiwan relationship. At least there's a possibility of an upside with China. But at the end of the day, once you've made the switch, China can just walk away because you're not going to go back again. Margaret, do you get a sense that over the years of looking at this, that there's a bait and switch? Or are the Chinese being upfront and they say, we're not making any promises, but if you come with us, there's a possibility? It's hard to know what happens behind the scenes, right? But my, my sense is that a lot of this is based on Latin American views of, or, you know, Taiwan ally views of just the prospects of more in the way of, of engagement with this very, you know, rapidly growing and important economic power. And yes, indeed, there are things that are being negotiated and promised. Um, a lot of them are not economic in nature, right? They're cooperation agreements in all sorts of different areas, to, uh, you know, technical assistance, things like that. Yeah. And so it's unclear whether, you know, there are big promises that are then withdrawn. I don't know that that's necessarily the case, but the promise, the promise is, is, is what's driving, I think, so much of this. And indeed, just as you mentioned, you know, if speaking of Paraguay, for example, which is the only Taiwan ally in South America, they're looking next door at Brazil and they're saying, gosh, you know, the trade with Brazil, the engagement with Brazil is more extensive than the engagement with us from Taiwan, right? And so they say, how can this be? And, you know, are we really deriving much benefit from this, from this bilateral dynamic? So the Paraguayans have basically said that they want a billion dollars of new investment from Taiwan or else they may consider switching their allegiance. Now that President Tsai Ing-wen came out and said that they're not going to do dollar diplomacy, one has to assume that that relationship is now in peril. Uh, one, I mean, just one would assume. Interestingly, there was a legislative delegation from Paraguay that was in Taipei at the time of the switch Haven't heard the outcomes of that meeting, but it would be very interesting to follow. Becky, I just want to wrap up our little tour of the Americas in Mexico. There's a lot of fascinating movement now in terms of Chinese corporate investment in Mexico and part of the China plus one strategy that is not only being done by U.S. and European companies who want to diversify some of their supply chains, but Chinese companies themselves are starting now to move across the border. 
in the U.S., in, I mean, in Mexico, in order to avoid some of the sanctions and also to be, have e easier access into the North American market. Do you see this engagement with Mexico changing the relationship between Mexico and China and the U.S.? And President AMLO came out this week and also said that whatever the United States does on TikTok, we're not going to do that. We're going to stay free. And that was kind of, a again, a nice little middle finger up to the United States, which the Mexicans like to do every once in a while. But talk about the Mexican-Chinese relationship now in terms of corporate investment. Absolutely. I think that the Bacanora lithium investment in Sonora in nor Northwest Mexico is really interesting. Uh, nothing's happening with it, but it's still really interesting. Why is it interesting? Because AMLO keeps making moves to nationalize lithium and Bacanora isn't going anywhere. They are uh, kind of embodying what Stephen Kaplan likes to call Chinese patient capital of we're just going to sit on this asset, see how this works its way out. Mexico is going to know that we're a partner they can come to whenever their process and strategy settles out. And I think that is really advantageous because when we look at all of these energy and infrastructure investments that have folks on the Hill in DC concerned, those are largely coming as purchases of investments that Western companies sold out of. So China's just going to sit on their assets instead of selling them the second that GDP slumps. Uh, and that's really attractive to a country who's trying to think about strategically developing a new asset that it has never developed before, like lithium reserves. So I'm going to be really interested to see how that works out in the coming years. Is Bacanora still going to stick around? Is Mexico going to find a way to incorporate Bacanora into whatever it does with nationalizing lithium? Especially, gotta say this, given the history of Sonora and neighboring Chihuahua in the revolution of Mexico, which was based on labor relations and foreign capitalists in mining, very, very important to the cultural identity and history of Mexico. What happens next with lithium and China in Sonora, Mexico? Very interesting. And then also, of course, this got on the radar for a lot of Americans when the New York Times ran a series about investment in the factory zones across the border. And then an episode of the Daily Podcast, which I think it's two to three million a day. And they did a whole show on Chinese investment in Mexico, which got a lot of people, you know, it's easy to kind of get Americans wound up on these things. So uh, but uh, let's close our discussion with both of you reflecting on the year ahead. So we understand a little bit taking your report and the research that you did about 2022, help us understand what 2023 is going to look like based on what you're seeing in Central and South America. Margaret, let's start with you. Sure. So, I mean, I think looking ahead, we're going to see a lot of, of the same sort of trends that we've seen over the past maybe two or three years, but maybe even a, a, a greater sense, right, that these things are happening. So uh, one, I think for sure, is continued localization of activity and and deal making. This is a, a big story in Mexico. I mean, uh, especially as Chinese companies, like all other companies, are trying to grapple with the policy environment there and, you know, wild swings at times in, in policy development that affect, you know, wide ranging sectors. And so there's a fascinating, it's since been taken down, but there was a post of an interview between the ambassador from China to Mexico and the head of the China Latin America Joint Fund, right? Um, or it was a joint cooperation fund. And they were talking about, you know, strategies for engagement with Mexico, given the difficult policy environment and, and not a very clear sense of what sort of the fourth transformation and, and the AMLO agenda really meant. And they said at this particular juncture, just as in other places in the region, when we're encountering different difficult policy and political, uh, you know, environment, it makes a lot of sense to do local deals, to engage with mayors, to engage with governors. And indeed, that's what's happening in a lot of Mexico when we look at the actual deals that are being struck. This is the same in much of the rest of of the region, especially in bigger countries, right, with federal systems and where, you know, municipalities or, or states or provinces have considerable decision making authority as concerns their own budgets. So a localization for sure. But that's also because we're going to see a focusing of economic activity, I think, on those sectors that China deems most critical to its own economic growth objectives. And this is becoming even more important, right, amid the real estate crisis in China and its effect on GDP growth and a need to really bank on productivity 
creativity and innovation to get them out of this. And so this is not a new thing, but I think it's going to be even more of an emphasis right across the board as it is across the global South in, in these countries and reinforces this notion of localization of deal making because indeed smart cities, safe cities, technologies are best negotiated at the municipal level. Becky, we're going to give you the last word. What's your forecast for the rest of the year? Small is beautiful lending finance throughout the Americas. I think that lending will continue to be small and targeted, but I think really interesting things are going to continue to happen just beyond lending. I'll be watching Paraguay to see if it goes the way of Honduras. And if it does, that opens up a possibility of a Mercosur-China free trade agreement. Uh, because that's really the main stumbling block between here and there right now. So we'll have really interesting possibilities just beyond the perimeter of development finance, the expansion of BRICS, expansion of New Development Bank, other ways of uh, Chinese lending and Chinese investment coming through in the relationship. Man, it's crazy how much is going on right now. I mean, you guys have been in this space for a long time. Have you ever seen it this busy? Or is it just me as a newbie into the America space? You know, I think that there's a great reason why Margaret decided to name our report at a crossroads. We are really at an inflection point and we're going to see whether the China lack relationship shifts towards critical minerals and transition minerals and new bilateral and multilateral engagement or whether it continues to be more cautious in the next year. Really interesting things on the horizon. Well, don't forget that last year, China did almost half a trillion dollars of trade with the Americas and the Caribbean. So it's a that's almost twice as much as with Africa. So it is a major trading partner now. Margaret Myers is a fellow at the Woodrow Wilson Center and directs the Asia and Latin America program at the Inter-American Dialogue. And Becky Ray, who you just heard from, is a senior academic researcher at the Boston University Global Development Policy Center. Becky, Margaret, thank you so much for taking the time to walk us through the the region. I didn't anticipate doing such a broad-based discussion, but there's just so much to talk about. It was great. We're going to put links to the report in the show notes, and uh, Becky will put your first report as well in the show notes because those complement each other nicely. Margaret, if people want to follow the work you're doing at IAD on Twitter, where can they find you? I'm at at Myers, M-Y-E-R-S, Margaret. Okay. And Becky, how about you? I'm at B-U, Becky Ray. Okay, I like that one. Uh, so we'll leave the conversation there again. Kobus will be back with us next week. So for Kobus, who is having a great time in Germany, I'm Eric Olander. Thank you so much for listening. The discussion continues online. Follow the China Global South Project on Twitter at China GS Project and share your thoughts on today's show or head over to our website at ChinaGlobalSouth.com where you can subscribe to receive full access to more than 5,000 articles and podcasts. Once again, that's ChinaGlobalSouth.com.